From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome to Potomac Watch. I'm Paul Gigo with the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. The awful details of the weekend massacre by Hamas killers of at least 1,300 Israelis and by last count, 25 Americans are still unfolding. More than 100 hostages are believed to be held in Gaza. The stories are horrific to read about and to see on videos, and the assault is changing the politics and security of Israel and perhaps the larger Middle East. Israel has formed a new coalition government with key opposition leaders, joining Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet as it prepares for what looks to be a ground assault on Gaza to root out and destroy Hamas. President Biden is promising what he calls unwavering and rock-solid support for Israel. This includes sending a carrier strike force to the eastern Mediterranean, as well as supplying weapons and almost surely intelligence. Mr. Biden also warned Iran against trying to take advantage of the war in Gaza, which it could do by mobilizing its other militias to open a northern front against Israel from Lebanon. There is much to discuss as these events unfold, and we have an ideal guest to talk about it today and Mark Dubowitz. He's the chief executive of Foundation for Defense of Democracies, a think tank focusing on global affairs and national security, with a special focus on the Middle East, China, and the war in Ukraine. Mark has also spent a considerable amount of time in recent months in Israel. Mark, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Great to talk to you. Thanks, Paul. So first, tell us about your reading on the psychological and political impact of this in Israel. Of course, Israel uh, has become, I think, to feeling secure against its neighbors. And now we learn that it is not. Well, as you mentioned, I, I just spent 14 months in Israel, just came back about a month ago. Look, I think Israelis for 75 years of their history have understood one clear thing, and that is that their enemies are seeking to exterminate them. And the enemies have made it very clear. Hamas in its founding charter in 1987 said exactly that. Through the 1990s and 2000s, Hamas suicide bombers were killing hundreds of Israeli men, women, and children. So for them, this is a shock. The horrors are unspeakable, but it shouldn't be a surprise because Hamas has been dedicated to Israel's destruction for decades, as has the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is funding, arming, weaponizing, and there may be indications directing and planning these attacks. So for Israelis, they're furious. The scale of the atrocities is not something they've seen since the Holocaust, but they are angry. They're unified. And Israelis are flooding in from overseas to join their combat units. And Israelis are signing up in great numbers for reserve duty. And Hamas and ultimately the regime in Iran will pay a severe price for this. I know we don't know the precise reasons that this was allowed to, not allowed to happen, that this happened, that uh, somehow the Israeli defenses were overwhelmed. Was it a kind of complacency, do you think, that has set in or what happened? One thing that happened is that the Israelis and I think the United States has underestimated not only the brutality of Hamas, but also the sophistication of Hamas. Hamas has been trained by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Quds Force of Iran. Um, So they are a sophisticated and deadly terrorist organization. And I think the Israeli Defense Forces didn't give enough credence to that level of sophistication. I also think that there hasn't been enough of an understanding, perhaps even in Israel, that Ali Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran, that his strategy has been to surround Israel on every border with a ring of fire of terrorists and weapons and missiles, and that he's been lighting up various borders in order to try and divert Israeli resources. So over recent 18 months, two years, the West Bank has erupted, thanks to Iranian support, through Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, another Iran-backed terrorist organization. And that required Israel to divert military resources to put down terrorism in the West Bank. That was terrorist attacks that were coming from the West Bank into Tel Aviv and into other Israeli cities. So while Israel was focused on the West Bank, Iran and Hamas saw the opportunity to strike through the Gaza border. Okay, so now Israel calling up more than 300,000 reserves. There are uh, troops massing around the borders with Gaza, Prime Minister promising the destruction of Hamas leadership. Any doubt that Israel is going to go in on the ground? And what will be the military objective? 
I think there's still some doubt. I don't think the Israeli government has yet made this decision. Look, the decision that they have made is that they will hunt down Hamas terrorists wherever they are, wherever they're hiding, not only in Gaza, but around the world. And so, Paul, you remember the massacre of Israeli athletes in 1972 at the Munich Games. Sure. You remember that sure. uh, the Israeli response to that was put together a Mossad uh, unit that was dedicated to finding, targeting, and eliminating every Palestinian terrorist who was responsible for that massacre. It actually took 10 years to find every one of them, but it was a concerted campaign to go after them. That decision has been made. There's no doubt in my mind that no Hamas operative of any nature, of any stripe, should feel safe right now. I think the decision on Gaza and sending in you know, 100,000 or so, whatever it is, Israeli soldiers is still a decision that the security cabinet is weighing. It's a very difficult decision because you're talking about very confined space with an enormous amount of humanity, civilians that Hamas uses as shields. You'd have to do house to house urban warfare, booby traps, tunnels, landmines. The casualties will be high on both sides. So it's a fraught decision, a very difficult decision. And yet the question becomes, if you don't do that, then how do you really root out the Hamas threat and prevent it from coming back in once you're able to get Iran to supply more weapons and missiles, rockets, and the rest? Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, look, the United States has had experience with this kind of urban warfare in the Middle East in places like Mosul, where the U.S. Air Force bombed targets in Mosul, ISIS targets in Mosul, Al-Qaeda bombing operations. And then we sent in our military and our special forces. And, and it was still, as I recall, months of heavy fighting. This is even more complicated for the Israelis in, in places like Gaza. The Hamas has taken advantage, has brought in not only weapons, but brought in concrete, which you would expect a responsible governing authority to use to build hospitals and schools and homes. They've built this labyrinth of terror tunnels under the entire territory of Gaza, which is where today the Hamas terrorists are hiding. And I would imagine Western hostages are being kept. So it, it's a brutal decision by the cabinet. But as you allude to, it may be something necessary for them to do in order to rid Gaza once and for all from this Iran-backed terrorist organization that has repeatedly launched wars, as you know, Paul, against Israel since they took over Gaza in 2005. That's exactly right. We've seen this uh, before. Israel went in, I think, in 2006, and maybe, if I recall properly, 2014, at least a little bit. And it's very difficult to work. Now, Israel doesn't want to run Gaza. We know that from what happened in 2005 when it turned it over to the Palestinians. But what do you envision the kind of governance Israel would settle for or would like in Gaza after this campaign is over? I think whoever rules Gaza, it can't be a terrorist regime and it can't be a regime backed by Iran. I mean, there have been multiple wars since that withdrawal in 2005 when Israel withdrew every soldier, every civilian, every grave left behind glass houses on the hope that this could be converted into an industry for, for Gaza. There was a hope at the time, as you remember, that this would be the first step to a Palestinian state, that the Palestinians would show that they could responsibly govern this territory and that perhaps would lead to an Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank, maybe East Jerusalem. And this would be the beginnings of a, quote, two-state solution. I, I think that assumption has been, I think, once and for all put to an end by the events of the recent few days. I think the Israelis also understand that they don't want to permanently occupy Gaza again. I don't think they want to also walk into a trap that I fear Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei is trying to set for them, which is to have Israel go in there and get permanently entrapped inside Gaza and then drain the resources of the IDF so that Khamenei can hit them on the northern border through Hezbollah, through the West Bank with Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and he can continue his march to nuclear weapons, having tied down the Israelis. It's incumbent upon not only the United States and Europe, but the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, all who have a stake in this, to think about what is the end state for Gaza. You know, you could see, in theory anyway, the Palestinian Authority somehow taking over. And yet that's a highly dysfunctional government. What Abbas, its head is ancient, and we don't know how long he will be alive. 
no real transfer of power situation available there that we know what would happen when he dies. And of course, Hamas could come back and assassinate all any officials who dare to take over from the PA. Yeah, that's exactly right. Look, I, I think the other thing that people are not talking about enough, though there have been some reports of discussions between the Biden administration and the Egyptian government, is that there is another border. There is an Egyptian border with Gaza. And one needs to ask this question, and I don't think it's being asked enough, and that is, shouldn't the Egyptians open their border to Palestinians looking to escape the brutal rule of Hamas and the military operations that are going on right now? The Sinai, which is Egyptian controlled, is essentially an open territory with lots of room for people to live as well. And I think, you know, because we don't want to put this all on the Egyptians, there are five countries that have financed armed, supported, and or trained Hamas. And those countries are, of course, Iran, as I mentioned, but also Qatar, American, quote, non-NATO ally, which has provided significant funding to Hamas, where senior Hamas terrorists seek refuge. The government of Turkey, which is a NATO ally, which has also provided funding where senior Hamas operatives have sought refuge. And the governments of Kuwait, and Algeria. Where's the international pressure on the five governments that have done the most to weaponize Hamas to take Palestinian refugees going from Gaza through the Rafah crossing into Egypt and onto the Red Sea? They should be forced to mount a rescue effort. I'm not optimistic they will, Paul. But where's the pressure on them to do so? Yeah, and particularly the Egypt crossing. Egypt has a quota on the number of Gazans who can cross into Egypt. And Israel is urging Egypt to open up that border more, even if on a temporary basis, to have some of the Gazans escape whatever might happen in the ground campaign. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll have more with Mark Dubowitz about the war in Gaza and the ultimate role in fomenting it by Iran. Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with The Wall Street Journal here with Mark Dubowitz, a chief executive of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Let's talk about what you mentioned earlier, and that is the chances of a second front opening in the north from Hezbollah. I assume this will depend upon what Iran wants. How do you read the chances? I think the chances really depend on U.S. policy. And if President Biden sends a clear, unequivocal message to the Islamic Republic and Iran, that if they unleash Hezbollah on Israel, there will be severe consequences for Iran that may deter a second front. Otherwise, I fear that we are going to see a second front. And I also fear that the second front in the north with Hezbollah will be far more dangerous. The consequences will be far more devastating than anything we've seen to date with Gaza and Hamas. Because remember, Hezbollah has hundreds of thousands of missiles. It has precision-guided missiles that can impose severe damage, not only on strategic sites in Israel, like energy infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, but also could do devastating damage to Israeli population centers. Uh, they will be trying to flood over the, that border thousands of hardened Hezbollah terrorists to go after Israeli communities in the north and do the kind of savage murder and mayhem that we saw Hamas do in the South. And so that northern border and that war could be devastating. I hope the IDF has the capabilities to fight on both fronts, but I certainly think President Biden needs to deter an Iranian decision, and it'll be an Iranian decision, make no mistake about it, to unleash Hezbollah in the north. The missiles that they have, uh, rockets, would they be able to elude the Iron Dome missile defense in Israel? Look, I think certainly Iron Dome has proven itself very effective, but you're talking about not only hundreds of thousands of missiles where sheer quantities could overwhelm Israeli air defense, but you're talking about precision guided munitions and missiles that are guided and are designed to elude air defense systems. So the Iranians have been building up this arsenal for years. And they've been just preparing for a moment exactly like this one to unleash those PGMs. 
and Hezbollah's missiles on uh, Israeli civilian centers and key infrastructure. I guess if there is a second front, one key question would be, would Israel ask the U.S. for military intervention? That is, for air power, perhaps, or even ground troops, if need be. And how would uh, President Biden respond? Israel's never asked for American troops on the ground, no matter how many times it's been attacked. But I wonder if this time could be different. That's exactly right. I mean, in its entire history, Israel's military ethos, which permeates all of Israeli society, is we will fight and defend ourselves. And we don't want American soldiers, you know, fighting and dying in our defense. So I think the Israelis will do everything possible to handle this on their own, on the southern border and on the northern border. I mean, you could imagine maybe absolute dire circumstances where they would call for American intervention. But I think what the Israelis want the United States to focus on is not the southern border or the northern border, but the head of the octopus, the head of the snake in Tehran, which is Iran, which is Khamenei and the regime. And there, we mustn't forget, Paul, that Iran is today a turn of a screw from having nuclear weapons. And if there was anybody who would ever doubt Iran's willingness to use those weapons to commit genocide, maybe the past few days should have opened some eyes when Hamas came in and decapitated Israeli babies and raped and burnt Israeli women. And the scale of the ferocity, there was genocide. And what Khamenei has also done to his own people in murdering and raping and launching chemical attacks against his own people on the streets of Iran. So the United States needs to focus on Tehran. It needs to focus on that nuclear program. And the only thing Khamenei fears is U.S. military force. That is the only deterrent to a much greater regional conflagration is his belief that U.S. military threats are credible and will be enforced. And that those threats could reach the Iranian homeland, military sites, nuclear program, and leadership, I assume. Now, one of the things that you've written about, and uh, certainly we've written about it, is the U.S. policy under the Biden administration, uh, since it took office, of seeking a rapprochement, I would call it, with Iran. They're pursuing, of course, they wanted to renegotiate and, and lock in again the 2015 nuclear deal that Barack Obama negotiated, at least in some form, even if it's watered down, they ease sanctions on uh, oil exports. Of course, they recently traded $6 billion for five Americans who were unjustly held in Iran and overall really did want Iran to calm down, to kind of put off its attacks and uh, what you've described already, though uh, there have been According to General Lloyd Austin, 83 attacks on American facilities or Americans by Iranian proxies during the Biden administration, and we've responded militarily only to four of those. What role do you think this administration's policy towards Iran has played in the recent events? I think it's played a central role, and I think it's played a central role because as many of us have been imploring the administration and certainly in debates with the Obama administration, we have said clearly that, that Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, pushes forward. When he feels American mush, he continues to escalate. When he feels American steel, he backs up. And President Biden, when he ran against President Trump, made it very clear that he would abandon the pressure campaign of his predecessor and he would return to diplomacy. That was exactly his policy and has been his policy ever since. It's providing really tens of billions of dollars in oil money and in uh, unfrozen funds to the regime. It is, as you say, a unwillingness to respond to attacks even against our troops. I mean, those four uh, responses were very minor to the 83 or 84 attacks from Iran-backed militias. The um, Administration has done everything possible to try to convince the Iranians to go back into the 2015 nuclear deal. And the response from Iran has demonstrated exactly what I suggested earlier about American mush versus American steel. As soon as President Biden was elected, the Iranians massively escalated their nuclear program. They didn't dare do that under Trump, but they massively escalated their nuclear program. They enriched to 20%, 60%, 84%, installed thousands of advanced centrifuges, stonewalled IAEA inspectors and essentially have taken their nuclear program to the brink of nuclear weapons on the watch of President Biden. And so you see a 
clear evidence that Iranian escalation will occur when they sense American weakness. And I think the Biden administration's deeply flawed Iran policy, which is a continuation of President Obama's fatally flawed Iran policy, has led us to the situation we are in today, including Khamenei's willingness to unleash Hamas against Israel, perhaps his unwillingness to unleash Hezbollah against Israel, and possibility of a regional conflagration. The big question is, is this event a large enough in its consequences and horrible enough in what we have seen that it will shake up the administration enough politically and shake up the American public and members of Congress enough so that Biden would be willing to change his policy on Iran into a return to maximum pressure on the economic front uh, in terms of sanctions and basically putting Iran on notice that it cannot get away with what it has been. I don't know what that involves, but it could be a multi-front, both putting pressure on Iran domestically, but also responding with real force to Iran's displays of force. Is it going to be a, enough, this, to change their minds? You know Washington. You know a lot of the players. What do you think? I think the Biden administration will launch a maximum pressure campaign against Hamas. I think he'll mobilize the interagency across the U.S. government to go after Hamas assets, Hamas financing, Hamas networks. I think that, yes, I mean, the level of commitment from the president was clear in the speech that he gave, which was not only deeply, I think, emotional for many people to listen to, um, but I think there was a clear indication of the president's anger about the savage, ISIS-like nature of the massacre that took place. So yeah, maximum pressure against Hamas, I see it coming. Maximum pressure against Iran, the head of the snake, I'm deeply skeptical that the president will will change his policy. And why is that? Why do you think he wouldn't do that? I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Jimmy Carter spent three years courting the Soviet leaders in an effort at detente and uh, modus vivendi and arms control. But they continued their pressure to spread uh, the revolution around the world in our hemisphere and Nicaragua and Africa, elsewhere. And then when he invaded Afghanistan, Jimmy Carter finally turned. And he said, you know what? I have to change my policy. And he started the arms buildup that Reagan later continued. I wonder if there's a comparable possibility of a shift for Biden. Yeah, look, I, I think, are we going to see more sanctions against Iran? Undoubtedly. Are we going to see a possibility that they will not release that $6 billion that's now sitting in Qatari banks to Iran that was provided as part of the hostage exchange? By the way, there's another $10 billion sitting in Omani banks. The administration also gave Iran right before the hostage exchange. So it's more like $16 billion, not $6 billion. Possibly. Yeah, I think political pressure is building. You're hearing from Democrats that uh, the Biden administration should not give Iran access to that money. Uh, you may see more oil sanctions. The Chinese are buying massive quantities of Iranian oil, enriching the regime since Biden took offer to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. So yeah, I, I could see sanctions. I could see that kind of pressure against Iran. But, but the real question is not whether President Biden is going to send in a carrier group into the Eastern Mediterranean, which he's done. It's not a question of whether he's going to provide significant military support in terms of weapon systems and JDAMs and precision guided munitions to Israel. I think he's going to certainly do his best working with Congress to try to do that. The question is, what is he going to do about Iran's nuclear program? Because if you think the horrors of the past few days were both inconceivable and just shocking, imagine this same regime in Iran with nuclear weapons. And, and I think this is the point that we are trying to underscore, is that we don't think our enemies are willing to commit atrocities. And we don't think the regime in Iran with a nuclear weapon would use such a weapon because, it, you know, it's a pragmatic regime that will be deterred by American power. Well, is it a pragmatic regime? I mean, this is the same regime that literally is using chemical weapons against Iranian students and massacres its own people. So imagine what it will do to Americans, Europeans, and Israelis if it has a weapon of mass destruction in its arsenal. So that's the question for President Biden and this administration what are you going to do to stop Iran's nuclear weapon while the Israelis have to deal with Hamas and potentially Hezbollah? And hopefully they can do that without uh, American boots on the ground. All right, uh, Mark Dubowitz, I think we will leave it there. This uh, ongoing story, many twists and turns to come. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise and your time with us, Mark Dubowitz, Chief Executive of Foundation for Defense of Democracies. 
Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks, uh, Mark. All right. And to all of our listeners, thank you. Great to have you here on Potomac Watch. We're here every day and hope to catch you tomorrow as well. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.